This video is a tribute to the life of Adelaide E. Stevenson II. From the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Dum dum, deedle dum dum, deedle dum dum, deedle dum dum. There was a turtle by the name of Bert, and Bert the turtle was very alert. When danger threatened him, he never got hurt. He knew just what to do. He ducked and cover, ducked and cover. Guys, this video is an excellent representation how my generation was traumatized by the prospects of nuclear war with the Soviet Union. I remember this exact video being shown in our classrooms in my elementary school and scaring the hell out of all of us. In fact, one day during the Cuban Missile Crisis in October 1962, I was so personally affected by these films, I took shelter in my home basement and ducked and covered just as demonstrated in these video clips, immediately after our town's air raid sirens accidentally engaged. You see, the rumor in Bloomington in those years was that our town was targeted by the Soviets because a local factory was manufacturing a certain part used in the production of our country's nuclear missiles. Thus, even our parents were fearful. This is why Adlai E. Stevenson is so admired to this day by the older population of Bloomington Normal, Illinois, because we all understand how close our two nations, the United States and the Soviet Union, almost destroyed one another. Ambassador Stevenson played a major role in the saving us all during those terrible days in October 1962. Hi all. Before we make our trek over to Evergreen Memorial Cemetery in Bloomington, Illinois, and visit the final resting place of a famous politician by the name of Adlai Ewing Stevenson II, I would like to highlight a few of his accomplishments. From 1949 until 1953, Mr. Stevenson was the governor of the great state of Illinois. I'm embarrassed to admit this fact, but I did not know this. I am a lifelong resident of Illinois. In 1951, Governor Stevenson received the Democratic nomination to run against Dwight D. Eisenhower for the 1952 presidential election. Losing this election by landslide, fortunately or unfortunately, depending upon one's political view. In 1955, Stevenson again received his party's nomination but loses the 1956 presidency for a second time to President Eisenhower. However, this man never quits. Stevenson again seeks the Democratic nomination to run for president for a third time, but loses to John Fitzgerald Kennedy. JFK, in turn, faces off with the Republican nominee of Richard Milhouse Nixon. Kennedy then wins the 1960 election and becomes the 35th president of the United States. A few weeks after Kennedy was elected, JFK offers the job of UN ambassadorship to Stevenson, in which Adlai humbly accepts. Unknown to the world at that moment, Adlai Ewing Stevenson II was to play a major role in the saving of the planet and possibly saving all mankind from total nuclear destruction. All inhabitants of this fragile earth owe a great debt of gratitude to Ambassador Stevenson for his calm and deliberate diplomacy during those 13 days in October 1962. He was the right man at the right time in the right place. Here we start our walk to Ambassador Stevenson's gravesite. As I retrace my steps on this hollowed ground, I can't help to have my memories flash back to that warm summer day in 1965. Even though I was only 14 years old some 56 years ago, 
I realized at my very young age I was witnessing a historical event as Adlai E. Stevenson II was about to be placed in his eternal home. I can remember that dignitaries of every caliber passed by in the funeral procession. President Lyndon B. Johnson, Vice President Humphrey, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Earl Warren, and Alberta Duff, the African-American housekeeper for the Stevenson's family when Adlai was a young boy. I also recall the abundance of Secret Service agents lining the streets along the funeral's path. My sister reminded me of a Secret Service agent perched on top of a power pole directly in front of our childhood home a few blocks from the cemetery with a rather large walkie-talkie. Of course, the Secret Service was still paranoid, rightly so, after the assassination of JFK a year and a half earlier. And one strange incident I remember is that one of the agents that stood near the crowd I was in told us all to clap our hands as the president's limousine was about to pass by. At the time, I thought this was an unusual request to clap at someone's funeral, but later learned that this appeal was implemented to allow the protectors of the president to more easily see our hands. If upon watching this video you can identify yourself, a relative or friend standing in any of the photos, please leave a comment in the comment section after this video. The Super 8 film of which I obtained these photos has sat dormant for all these years, thus the poor quality of the prints. Unfortunately, being a young 14-year-old, I was not educated in the art of using a movie camera. Therefore, the film is very jerky unfocused and I was panning too fast. This is the reason I decided to show snapshots of the film and not show any film segments. So the viewer is probably asking these questions about now. How did Stevenson save the world? Why did so many VIPs attend his funeral? And why did so many residents in Bloomington Normal line the streets of the funeral route in some places 10 to 12 deep. The Illinois State Police estimated that over 50,000 folks lined the route to show the respects to this great man. Stevenson's dramatic moment came in the afternoon of October 25th at an emergency meeting of the UN Security Council, in which most historians agree was the 10th day in the 13th day crisis. The Soviet ambassador promised the world that the USSR had in no way installed nuclear missiles in Cuba. President Kennedy was intently watching the meeting on television at the White House. Stevenson was known to be timid and low-keyed at times, and Kennedy was worried that Adelaide would miss the chance to convince the world that the Soviets had indeed placed nuclear armed missiles in Cuba aimed at the United States. It is now time for Ambassador Stevenson to speak. He pulled no punches. I quote, I want to say to you, Mr. Zorin, that I do not have your talent for obfuscation, for distortion, for confusing language, and for double talk. And I confess to you that I'm glad that I do not, unquote. Most historians agree that the beginning of the end of the Cuban Missile Crisis started with these two quotes by Adlai Stevenson. Quote, All right, sir, let me ask you a simple question. Do you, Ambassador Zorin, deny that the USSR has placed and is placing medium and intermediate range missiles and sites in Cuba? Yes or no? Don't wait for the translation. Yes or no? When the Soviet ambassador ignored the question with his head lowered, 
Stevenson shot back. And Stevenson immediately replied, You can answer yes or no. You have denied they exist. I want to know if I understood you correctly. I am prepared to wait for your answer until hell freezes over, if that's your decision. And I am also prepared to present the evidence in this room. And Stevenson then gave the signal to his aides to pull back the curtains, displaying Russian nuclear missiles in various stages of construction on Cuban soil. Stevenson motioned again to his aides, having them to expose additional photographic proof of a number of operational Russian nuclear missiles at the ready. Silence penetrated the auditorium of the Security Council, as all present realized the Russians had been lying all along. In other words, they were caught red-handed. Three days later, the leader of the Soviet Union, Khrushchev, agreed to remove all Russian nuclear missiles from Cuba, and the world let out a sigh of relief. Nuclear war between the United States and Russia was averted. During my research for this video, I found immediate press release from the Office of the White House Press Secretary titled, The White House Statement by the President, dated October 28, 1962. It reads as follows. I welcome Chairman Khrushchev's statesmanlike decision to stop building bases in Cuba, dismantling offensive weapons and returning them to the Soviet Union under United Nations verification. This is an important and constructive contribution to peace. We shall be in touch with the Secretary General of the United Nations with respect to reciprocal measures to assure peace in the Caribbean area. It is my earnest hope that the governments of the world can, with a solution of the Cuban crisis, turn their urgent attention to the compelling necessity for ending the arms race and reducing world tensions. This applies to the military confrontation between the Warsaw Pact and NATO countries, as well as to other situations in other parts of the world where tensions lead to the wasteful diversion of resources to the weapons of war. Be sure to hit the notification button to see future videos. I am planning a video featuring my interaction with Sergei Khrushchev, the son of Chairman Nikita Khrushchev, the leader of the Soviet Union during the Cuban Missile Crisis. I will reveal my conversations with Dr. Khrushchev relating to the missile crisis and why Sergei believes Oswald did not work alone in the assassination of President Kennedy. I had no idea. Don't miss this video. And thank you for watching Spirits of the Cemetery.